Hey, my name is Paige O'Mardian, and you're watching Coffee with Paige. So grab your coffee or tea or whatever it is you drink and settle in, because I want to introduce you to our guest for today, Alexis Slifer. Now, Alexis and I have known each other since I was 18 and she was 15, um, because we were a part of the iShine tour when it first started. Mm -hmm. And um, so, Alexis, you've been part of the Rubies now for how many years? Almost <laughs> seven. Oh <Yeah>. my gosh. <laughs> Yeah, and Easy. we've been out on several tours together, lots of memories, lots Definitely. of experiences together. <laughs> so she has been such just a godly woman for all the years that I've known her. And I'm just so excited to have her with us today because you went to Cambodia recently. I did. I just got back about a month ago. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So I want to ask you just about that experience. How was it? And first of all, how did you even decide to go? It was a very long process. I think I was 13 the first time God really laid on my heart just orphans and trafficking in general. I didn't really know where or anything specific. And we went on a tour um, when I was 15 called Believe. Mm. And we had a group there called the Rafa House. And they're in Cambodia and they're a safe house. So girls can just go and live there and um, take refuge from trafficking. And I just completely fell in love with the organization and got to know one of the ladies that volunteered and came on the tour with us and just talked to her every week. It was for 30 weekends that we went out. And every week we would just talk about it over and over and over. I'm sure she got tired of <laughs> explaining it, but I knew I wanted to go. I, I just knew I would have to be there eventually. And mm -hmm. I looked into trips with them, but you had to be 18 and I was only 15. So I knew I would have to wait. So now I'm 20, so it's a little bit later. But um, <laughs> the year of 18 and 19 were just crazy and busy. And um, I was in the Dominican with some of my friends from iShine, you know, yeah. Rachel and Olivia, all of yeah. them. And on the way back, I just kept crying and realized that I needed to be in Cambodia. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know why or how it was supposed to happen. So I just kept asking God, why? And he so simply just said, stop making it so difficult and go. Wow. So I said, okay. And I got home that night. It was probably 1.30 in the morning. And I just Googled mission trips to Cambodia. <laughs> How do I get there? And the first thing that came up was adventures and missions. Okay. And so I was like, all right. I filled out the application, called my mom the next morning and told her I was going. Wow. And... Decided I was going to go five months later. <laughs> wow. Okay. Yeah. So you just knew that that had been on your heart, that God was saying go. Definitely. So, okay. So you you went over there. Did you know much about just the history or had you studied some of it beforehand? Well, I'm a reading buff. I read and I read and read. So I tried to be prepared and I read six or seven books about Cambodia and tried to learn the language, but... That's nearly impossible. <laughs> I know how to say hello, and that's pretty much it. How do you it. say hello? It's um, Sustai. Sustai. Yeah. Okay, so, awesome. And you have to bow. Sustai. Sustai. Yeah. yeah. Very cool. <laughs> and after um, reading a bunch of those books, I figured I was prepared until I got there and realized I was not. Mm -hmm. So the first day, we just learned some of the language and the culture and visited some um, genocide museums, mm -hmm. which were traumatic, to say the least. Yeah. Um, and just meeting... One of our tour guides, he was actually part of it. And his family, he saw them all be killed right in front of him. Gosh. And one of the soldiers just told him to run and get out quickly. Wow. So he did. And now he just gives tours every day of the same place that his family was killed. Mm -hmm. And that just broke me completely. Hmm. So when I first went over, I thought that I was going to be angry and bitter at all the men there because they're selling all of their wives and children to this trafficking. Gotcha. And once I realized the culture, I just fell in love with the entire country. Hmm. Well, so tell me a little bit about the history. So you you mentioned before when we were talking um, a couple days ago that there was just a dictator that came in to, to rule? There was about 30 some years ago, there was a dictator that came in and just mass killings everywhere. They would tell people that they were going to take them to jobs and load them up in the back of a truck, blindfold them, and then take them out to these fields and just completely slaughter them. Mm -hmm. And so now they call it um, the year zero because the dictator totally ruined everything in their country, their government, their jobs, schools, everything. It's just mm -hmm. they had to start from scratch again when he was dethroned and 
they're in prison. And you and you mentioned that there were no older people there. There aren't. When when you walk down the streets, there may be I think I saw three when I was there. People over about fifty. And most of them were beggars or they had um, like burn marks all down their faces. You can tell that they were part of it. But they killed off almost every single person from any older generation than about 50. So the the children had to kill their parents then? Yes. It it wasn't the same as like the child soldiers. But they would come in and say, either you kill your family or we will kill you with them. Mm -hmm. So most of the kids did it. Oh my gosh. Wow. Yeah. And that's one of the main reasons now they don't think that trafficking is that bad because most of them killed their parents. So trafficking their child during the day doesn't seem like that bad. Yeah. Well, so tell me about the trafficking part. It's horrendous. We went into a few little villages and they're known for selling their children on the streets at night. Mm -hmm. So we went into a few different places and the kids would just be standing on the porch just waiting for someone to walk by and pick them. And their parents sell them. I think that's the first thing I thought when I got there, that children were being abducted and sold. But the truth is their parents are doing it nightly. Hmm. That's so hard to even fathom. And, I mean, so there are safe houses there that you visited. Yes. And so what was just... You know, the experience with meeting some of the girls, some of the children that are sold, what was that like? I think one of the craziest things was that they don't act that different. Hmm. Some of the children, I was holding this little girl and playing with her, and she looked really cute, like she'd been playing with makeup, and one of the guys came over and told me that the reason she had makeup on is because her mom was preparing to sell her for later. And how old was she? She had to be four, maybe, at the oldest. Hmm. And... It, it doesn't seem real. I mean, even holding her and him telling me that with her sitting in my arms still doesn't feel real. Like, that, that it's not possible to me. Wow. Hmm. I can't even imagine that. It's mm-hmm. just like a completely different world. And it is. I mean, completely. and so so you visited different safe houses, and mm-hmm. what did you get to do a lot while you were there? We just got to, like, teach the girls how to sew or teach them how to bake We went to a lot of different places um, that are restaurants that only employ girls who came out of prostitution and that kind of thing. Okay. And so they've decided to make a change with their life. And the entire staff is like that. They have that past. So we went to a bunch of places like that, and they just gave us tours and showed us um, their schools that they now go to. And a lot of them bake cupcakes. Mm -hmm. (laughs) That's, like, one of their favorite things to do. So we would teach them different ways to make cupcakes and stuff like that, just daily things that you think that they would know, but they, they don't. Yeah, so so basically as they're grown, growing up, they're not sent into school, most of the children. Mm-hmm. They're just sent off to be trafficked. Yes. So they don't know, they don't have an education, they're not sent to school, and that's really because of the families feeling like that's the only yeah. way to make a living, is that right? Yeah, the strange thing is over in like Cambodia and a few other Asian countries, the person who brings home the money and is the provider of the family is the women hmm. because they're Buddhist and the um, men, they become monks and they get their merits and all of that. I'm not sure completely how all of that works, okay. but so the women are the providers. Okay. So therefore, that's why they go into prostitution most of the time. They can't make enough money just selling fruit on the side of the road, though okay. they probably do that during the day. Gotcha. It's very interesting because a lot of the kids, they come out and they would be beggars or they would be selling books or bookmarks, little things like that. And some of them would make enough money during the day and they didn't have to be sold that night. Hmm. But if they didn't make enough, then that's when their parents trafficked them at night. I see. Wow. Well, and you shared a little bit about you got to see one of like the trafficking rooms or whatever, right? Yeah, it's called the Pink Room, and I'm pretty sure they're getting ready to release a movie about it or something. Okay. But it's just a room that was in um, an old brothel okay. that they bought out, and so that's an incredible redemption story all of itself. Yeah. Um, but they bought it out, and it used to be a room where men could go and just pick out a girl, and all of them were virgins. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. <laughs> oh, that's so crazy. Okay, so you you got to see brothels. And one thing yeah. that you mentioned when we were talking before is that the, it's actually, prostitution is illegal yeah. in that country. Which I was like, wait, what? How is that the yeah. main thing that's going on there? But you said it's just kind of 
the government that yeah the government is just very corrupt and maybe it might not be corrupt as higher up like the king and things like that but the police officers I see. um most of them can be bribed or um they say like if you would look at it as a tube there's just holes in it so even if you know this officer saw a brothel and saw it firsthand he knows it's true then the next person to come by and mm. you know the lawyer or something who has to say if it's true or not he's the one that's being bribed mm. so there's just holes in so much of the system that they can't really fix it right now wow yeah well so what was god speaking to your heart when you were there like what was going through your mind as you're walking the streets seeing first of all such a broken country with what yeah. they've been through I cannot even imagine like having having what's happened to them happened to my family I just it's unfathomable so what was going through your heart as you're knowing the broken country knowing you know what's going on with the women right now I think one of the neatest things was when I was there, I was completely broken for them. I cried most of the time. And so we were driving through another one of the genocide museums where, I mean, literally it is gruesome. There are just bones, skeletons still everywhere. They mm -hmm. haven't cleaned them up because they wanted to remind them not to let that happen again. And I just looked around and saw how dirty and terrible it was. And the I was just praying, God, you have to do something. I don't know what you want to do. And I was feeling so hopeless. And God just clearly said to me, I'm ready to make this new if they turn back to me. Wow. Just like he, he's, there's hope. Wow. He's still there for them if wow. they would just call to him. And that was interesting. That It's like 98% Buddhist? It is, yeah. So they, they need to hear about Jesus. You said yeah. that people don't even know his name, right? They don't. No, hmm. a bunch of the little children that we tried to talk to, no idea who Jesus was. And it's, and it's not illegal to be a Christian in that country. Not at all. So you can go in as a missionary. There's just a lot of work to be done. Yes, definitely. Wow. That's but amazing. there are tons of people over there getting things done for sure. It's a yeah. slow process, but there is definitely hope there. Oh, that's so, that's so wonderful. Well, mm -hmm. so tell me, what is God right now just speaking to your heart in general? This is a new season of life. You just mm -hmm. turned 20, right? I did, yeah. <laughs> So what has God been speaking to your heart in just this new season? The neatest thing is that I came back from Cambodia and as I shared with you, I would just be like laying on the floor of my room, ready to go, just mm. surrendering everything. God, take me to Cambodia. Yes. I don't want to be here anymore. Not that America isn't great, but I just, I had this craving to just change the world. I wanted to change the world. And so God taught me something that I thought I'd already mastered, which is that he's enough. And when I learned it earlier on in life, it was from the aspect of boys and like, I don't need a husband. I don't need a boyfriend right now. God is enough and he is sufficient. But instead of waking up in the morning now and thinking, well, how can I change the world? What can I do next? How can I be abandoning myself? Mm -hmm. God really convicted me to just wake up in the morning and fall more in love with him and be mm -hmm. thinking about how much more time can I spend in his presence? Mm -hmm. Because though changing the world is great, I think it's in Deuteronomy how it says that man sees outward appearance, and that's great, but God looks at the heart. Yeah. And you know, in like Matthew 22, God um, tells the disciples that the number one commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Yes. So he's really convicted me not to be distracted by the fact that I do want to change the world, and that's great if he calls me to do that. Yeah. but that he is enough and not to forget what called me to changing the world in the first place. That's so good because I think I think that's true. Sometimes you get overwhelmed with a lot of needs or even, you know, well, what am I supposed to do with my life? That massive question. <laughs> but, I mean, it's really comes back to what Jesus said is the greatest commandment, which is our purpose as Christians, to love the Lord with all of your heart and mind and soul and then to love your neighbor as yourself. Exactly. And as we love God, He pours His love into us mm -hmm. so that we can love others because we can't love the others until we've received the love from God. Exactly. So mm -hmm. that's such an important thing. Well, Alexis, thank you so much for just getting thank to share you. about Cambodia and just your heart. And you're just an inspiring girl. Oh, and I'm just so grateful to have you as my friend. So, all right. Well, we will see you next Tuesday on Coffee with Paige. Again, my name is Paige O'Mardian. 
and you just heard from Alexis Slifer. We'll see you next week on Coffee with Paige.